Good morning to everyone. My name is Darrell Crump. I'm president of the Orange County African American Historical Society. We work in partnership with the Art Center in Orange in doing a number of projects. One of the biggest ones that we do with them is Juneteenth. We are thankful and grateful for this great partnership. The Orange Center, Art Center in Orange has been doing great work in this community for years now. They have impacted the town of Orange and the county of Orange and the surrounding area. They've been impacting that area for years. So we're grateful for all that's going to transpire today. It's going to be a great morning. We hope that you enjoy it, take notes, and come out to the Art Center and, and look around and do some things and explore it. It will be a time well spent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend Crum, for that lovely introduction to what we do in this program, which is, of course, as Reverend said, a very important program to us here at the Art Center. We really love working with the Historical Society and James Madison's Montpelier to bring Juneteenth to Orange and to help share some stories and, you know, just create more of that community feeling in our hometown. So thank you, everyone who's joining us in person and online today. We've got some really interesting pre presentations for you. Starting things off, We'll have Michael Carter Jr. from Carter Farms, who's going to be giving us a presentation and a little bit of a history lesson. Following his presentation, we have a lovely and very moving video by Dr. Dina Jennings, who many of you will know um, as many, many things. She wears many hats in our community. While she can't be here today because she's on sabbatical, she has truly given us a gift in her video, and it really does speak for itself. So with no further ado, I'll introduce you to Michael Carter, Jr., who is giving the first presentation. Thank you again for joining us today. Michael? Good morning, everyone. How are you all today? Very good, very good. We're all here for the 4th of July celebration, right? <laughs> Juneteenth, right? <laughs> A celebration commemorating acts of freedom, acts of courage, acts of bravery. And I'm gonna share another side of Juneteenth. Our personal side, our Orange County side, a perspective that you probably won't hear in any other history books, you probably would never hear. So as uh, Pastor Crom said, please take some notes. I encourage you, uh, I turn my art into history. So this is gonna be a very artsy, not artsy, historical lesson. Stay awake, please. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna share a lot with you. It's gonna be a little different than the normal narrative, uh, but hopefully you'll find a lot of good information in this, and this is the truth about Juneteenth. And I am Michael Carter, Jr. Uh, of Carter Farms. My family has owned a farm in Unionville, Virginia since 1910. Uh, we have been Orange residents probably since the early 17, well, mid-1700s. Uh, a portion of my family arrived here in 1745 from Scotland. There were Black Scots, the Macintoshes, and they were in Orange County. Uh, other portion of my family arrived somewhere between 1619, 1622 and 1692-ish. Um, my family's history comes from the first plantation in America, Shirley Plantation, which is in Charles City, Virginia. Uh, and we trace our lineage back to Angola, so some of those individuals could have been coming on those first ships from Angola to here. Um, but as many of us know who are African Americans, tracing your roots back past the Civil War can be extremely, extremely tough uh, because records are not kept of these individuals. Um, and because of this, I wanted to acknowledge those individuals first and foremost. So before we begin, we'll take a nice moment of silence to acknowledge those individuals who've given everything so that we could be here today. And here's the truth about Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. 
And before I begin again, I would like to give thanks to those researchers, pioneers, historians, and the great architects of this brilliant strategy that we're going to talk about and discover today. The African American Civil War Museum, uh, a brief mentor of mine, Dr. Harry Jones, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, Dr. Martin Delaney, Mr. William Howard Day, Dr. John S. Rock, Sister Harriet Tubman, Dr. Gerald Horn, and a myriad of other scholars, researchers, and griots who have kept this story alive so we can understand better how we came to this day, Juneteenth. And Juneteenth would be nothing without these individuals here. These are some of the United States color troops that were born in Orange County, Virginia. These were, you know, look at these names carefully. Some of these may be your ancestors. Lewis Anderson, Charles Billings. As a matter of fact, say it with me. Let's give their, their, their existence some meaning. Lewis Anderson. Okay. So we're going to have to restart those slides over. Can we repeat the name after you? Absolutely. Uh, I'm a, in the tradition of uh, the African Rio call and response is quite common. If you're in the black church and they say hallelujah, you say amen, right? Amen. <laughs> so, yes. so we don't go into church this morning, right? Yes. Saturday yes. church. So let's call the names of these ancestors who made it so that we could be here today. Lewis Anderson. Lewis Anderson. Charles Billingsley. Charles Billingsley. James Bradshaw. James Bradshaw. Henry Buchanan. Henry Buchanan. Horace Buchanan. Horace Buchanan. William France. William France. James Fraser. James Fraser. Edmund Gilmore. Edmund Gilmore. Clem Harris. Clem Harris. John Perkins. John Perkins. James Corder. Jacob White. Jacob White. Peter White. Peter White. James White. James White. Arthur Allen. Arthur Allen. Trim Banks. Trim Banks. James Bannister. James Bannister. Forrest Bowler. Forrest Bowler. William Brooks. William Brooks. Henry Carter. Henry Carter. Jerry Carter. Jerry Carter. Henry Clow A. Clay. Samuel Cobb. Samuel Cobb. Henry Cooper. Henry Cooper. Fleming Crum. Fleming Crum. Thomas Crum. Thomas Crum. Henry Day. Henry Day. Thomas Dunmore. Thomas Dunmore. James Ellis. James Ellis. Harrison Fayborn. Harrison Fayborn. Albert Fraser. Albert Fraser. James Fraser. James Fraser. Peyton Fry. Peyton Fry. Robert Ferguson. Robert Ferguson. Samuel Gallup. Samuel Gallup. Charles Gordon. Charles Gordon. Louis Green. Louis Green. Sonny Grimes. Sonny Grimes. Henry Hackett. Henry Hackett. Edward Hall. Edward Hall. John Hargrove. John Hargrove. Henry Hill. Henry Hill. Alan Holliver or Tolliver. Alan Holliver. George Holmes. Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. Louis Jackson. Louis Jackson. William Jennings. William Jennings. John Jennings. John Jennings. Franklin Jennings. Franklin Jennings. Edwin Johnson. Edwin Johnson. Horace Johnson. Horace Johnson. John Kennedy. John Kennedy. Henry Lake. Henry Lake. Richard Lee. Richard Lee. Henry Leggett. Henry Leggett. William Lovers. We say these names to honor these gentlemen, not so their souls can rest in peace per se, but for their souls to live on in us. These were our ancestors who gave up their very freedom so that we could have freedom. They fought for a cause greater than that of anyone who's ever fought in America. They fought for the freedom of every American to be free, to be liberated, to be justified. And the one in the red, when I was doing my research, uh, the name was familiar. And it turned out to be, potentially is, uh, my great, 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 great <laughs> grandfather. My great grandmother's great grandfather, James Ellis. And it didn't register until I started asking questions. I have this record 
And this document here is a slave registry from June 1860 for Orange County. And we have this document. I always thought that Courtney Ellis, my great grandmother's grandmother, I thought she was on this document. But looking at her census records, she was born in 1870, so she wouldn't have been on this document here. But her father was, James Ellis. So he's in here. And unfortunately, in these records, there's no indication of names. There's only ages. So you can never really tell for sure if or if not. But the reason I had this document is because this was part of our lineage. And uh, family members discovered it. And we've kept it as part of that lineage. And we know that Courtney Ellis was an Ellis. And this is for Robert Ellis's plantation. On there, he had about 20 enslaved Africans. And of that, I'm assuming that James Ellis was one of those Africans that were enslaved, who ultimately ended up fighting for the freedom of you and I. And that's the story that's not always shared about Juneteenth. Well, we're usually told about the traditional definition of Juneteenth as one being the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. From its roots in Galveston, Texas in 1865, the observance spread across the U.S. We're told that a general comes down to Texas and he shares the news that the Emancipation Proclamation is in full effect and you're now free and individuals celebrate. We're going to challenge that notion just a little bit. Because what we don't hear about is those individuals who made it possible that before the Emancipation Proclamation could come into effect, individuals had to fight to ensure that federal, the, the Union Army had control of that jurisdiction. But we'll talk about that just a little bit later. And this quote here from W.E. Woodward. Uh, he's a historian, author, filmmaker. This is the quote that's kind of permeated throughout Orange County, the state of Virginia, and the U.S. The American Negroes are the only people in the history of the world, so far as I know, that ever became free without any effort of their own. This is the, this is the lost cause mindset. This is what's pushed in schools. This is what's pushed in all of the doctrines about from anybody who's uh, empathized or sympathized with the Civil War, with Southern states, with states' rights. This is the idea that we got freedom without fighting. That I mean, that Abraham Lincoln just read a document or wrote a document and just, poof, we became free. Wasn't quite that way. And W.E.B. Du Bois shared this in 1935 from his essay, The Propaganda of History. How the facts of American history have in the last half century been falsified because the nation was ashamed. The South was ashamed because it fought to perpetuate human slavery. The North was ashamed because it had to call into the action black men to save the Union, abolish slavery, and establish democracy. And it's a shame that we've all heard and seen. Any Confederate sympathizer will tell you that the Civil War was not over slavery. It was over states' rights. It was over tariffs. It was over Northern aggression. And most folks will tell you as well that the, the Union wanted to free the slaves. But we're going to go into that as well. Before we get there, I think most of us have heard of the KKK, correct? The Ku Klux Klan. But few of us have ever heard of the LLL, the predecessor to the KKK, the Lower League, the Lower Legal League, or as they call it in Mississippi, Lincoln, Lincoln's Lower Legal League. This was the covert ops of the Underground Railroad. These were the architects of freedom. These four gentlemen here, William Howard Day, Major Martin Delaney, Frederick Douglass, and Dr. John S. Rock, 20 years before the Civil War, orchestrated and thought out what needed to happen for African Americans to be free again in this country. And they had a very clear understanding of what events needed to take place to cause a skirmish between the, the, the Union or the Northern states and the Southern states, and put things into motion to make those things a reality. The secret was so secret that many of us never heard of it. <laughs> this was a totally, totally unknown reality. The only people that knew about it was the CIA. The CIA understood and recognized their brilliance in terms of keeping the secrets about what needed to be done to fight and maintain freedom. And you can always Google anything I say. Um, I have a very, I'm very confident in what I speak about. So please Google it, Wikipedia it. Fact check it, but 
but legal, the Lower Legal League was the architects of the freedom for African Americans. Did very little, if not any credit. And we also don't give a lot of credit to those enslaved Africans who spoke a little different. We hear a lot of that in books, in movies, how the enslaved Africans spoke. But before the cold talkers of World War II, these African Americans, or these Africans in America at the time, were also using a certain code. Were also code talkers, revealing to those who knew the code certain things about the character of individuals. If you ever read the book uh, by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, you remember Sambo. Sambo was the antagonist of that story. Uncle, Uncle Tom was the protagonist. Sambo was the antagonist. Master. You always hear, hey, Master. Yes, sir, Master. Not that they couldn't say Master, but Master was part of the language they knew and had a wholly different meaning. You hear, yes, sir, yes, sir, boss. Yes, sir, we. We were thinking they couldn't speak English properly. They knew exactly what they were saying and how they were saying it, and it had a very specific meaning. Him be, him be a good man. Him be a good man. Holler, me holler. So when you hear something like, yes, yes, sir, Maxie, what they're really saying in the Fulani tongue, the Fula tongue was, yes, evil, devilish, captive, oppressor. They were revealing the spirit and the character of those individuals. Because in the Fulani tongue, Sambo meant brave warrior or second son. Massa meant Egypt or captain. Seri meant one with evil intent or the devil. Hembi, Hembi meant one of the faith, a trustworthy, loyal person. Hala meant speak. Me means I. I spent a little time in West Africa, a little time in East Africa as well, so some of these words are very familiar to me. Uh, within the Hebrew language even, you would hear Hala. Hala means everybody speak. So these were all languages that these individuals used. And Fulani was a unique one because the Fulani were nomads in West Africa. So they generally were in between Mali and Senegal to the north. And they traveled all the way down the west coast and into Congo and some other places. And they did business. So a lot of individuals who were born here understood and could hear Fulani. They may not be to speak it totally, but they understood certain meanings about it. And Fulani were also great herdsmen. Great cattlemen, that's what they do even to today. Great agriculturalists. So a lot of those individuals were picked up intentionally because of their agricultural skill and board here. And instead of playing, the, they played the role of the enslaved. They were enslaved, but they played the role of it. So they utilized their intelligence and the perception about themselves to figure out how to come, become free again. So they had a special code language that they used amongst on the plantation. And what it did was, Changed the minds of the Confederacy or just the Southern landowners even further. They think these people were just ignorant. They couldn't speak properly. They didn't understand the language, which played into their favor as we go on. And we'll talk more about that. And then there were great symbolic demonstrations, as they would call it. Many of us are familiar with Nat Turner. And Nat Turner's insurrection is as Nat Turner would say, as you call it. For him, it wasn't an insurrection. Nat Turner was an individual, and they called him a slave preacher. He said he had spiritual gifts, and he had spiritual gifts from birth. And he was in a place that was, had a spiritual name to it. So Nat Turner saw himself more like a Moses. So when he had his insurrection, he would refer to it more as a demonstration, very much the same way Moses came to Pharaoh and demonstrated the power of the Creator, the power of God. By, making, by bringing down the plagues. Nat Turner used this as a demonstration to Pharaoh, to Massa, this evil captain, this man from Egypt, this Pharaoh, and showed them what would happen if you don't free my people. If you don't let my people, there's going to be a bloodletting. In 1832, in Jerusalem, Virginia, that's exactly what happened. Southampton, Capron, Cortland, that area is called Jerusalem, or was called Jerusalem during that time. So Nat Turner was hung down in Jerusalem. A symbolic message to everyone around him of his role in this struggle. That he was almost like a messiah. He was put himself on the line to be hung. 
in Jerusalem, very much like his Savior and those that he read about in the Bible, Jesus the Christ. And it also, the Lincoln Law League was very clear. They didn't want anybody to just have insurrections. They understood that for them to gain freedom, they had to be in league with the Constitution. That was where the Law League came from. They wanted to make sure they were in league with the Constitution. They saw the Constitution as the only way they could gain their freedom. That based upon this document, what was written, if it was honored truly, we would have our freedom. So when John Brown met with the League, members of the Lincoln League, or the Law League, he wanted to have a raid at Harvest Ferry. You know how much support he got from the Law League? <laughs> Zero. And a unique thing about that is Frederick Douglass and others would call him Captain John Brown. And they put Captain there because they wanted him to understand his position in the struggle. They would call Harry Tubman General, General Moses. Douglas was referred to as a general. Now, in any military campaign, a captain never gives orders to a general, right? The generals give the orders to the captain, but John Brown couldn't quite understand his role in this because what he saw was not in league with the Constitution, was not in league with the lower league. Therefore, he got very little, if not any, support for his rape. But they utilized it as propaganda. And they started to write about all this, uh, the raids, and it's creating a fervor, which started to lead to the Civil War. In the Civil War, we understand there was a raid in Charleston. But there were unique factors within, in the Civil War that happened prior to and up to. This particular one was unique because we always think that the North was unified in terms of their position in the Civil War. However, in 1861, the mayor of New York City had written a letter and campaigned that they wanted to succeed with the Confederacy. Not necessarily in line with the Confederacy, but because 60% of the revenues from cotton came through New York and the northern states, they wanted to be a Switzerland-like, Switzerland-type uh, entity within the United States. You know, hands off. We're not for the North or for the South. We're for the money. <laughs> and from the words of Alexander Stevens, the Vice President of the Confederacy, who made this statement in 1861 in his cornerstone speech, when people say that the <laughs> Civil War was not about slavery, this statement and his quote says, "Our new government is founded upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white." the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is its natural and normal condition. Not to mention the <clears throat> documents, Articles of Secession that every state wrote. Almost every state that seceded had a clause in it, the first and second clause, about slavery being the reason for them to secede. So anybody who tells you that this is not the reason for slavery, they just don't know history. <laughs> because it was written that the reason why these states were seceding was because of slavery. And the reason, not necessarily they was gonna stop, but they didn't want any, any, any hindrances, any hindrances to this institution. Because who wants their money to stop? No one wanted their money to stop, from the North or the South. And it's very evident, anybody know the president before uh, Abraham Lincoln? Everybody knows it. He's like on the $8 bill. Come on. No? James Buchanan. Everybody, you're going to tell me your tongue, I know. <laughs> James Buchanan. Prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation pretty much stated that enslaved Africans in the Confederate States would be free once they came part of the Union again. He said nothing about the enslaved Africans in the Union. So the Emancipation Proclamation freed no one who it could free and freed individuals that had no control or jurisdiction over. So it freed slaves in Georgia, certain parts of Louisiana, North Carolina. But the, C the CSA, the Confederate States of America, were not part of the Union, therefore they didn't abide by it. Because many times we're told, January 1st, 1863, Lincoln freed the slaves. 
who were told the story, who were told the story. You wrote the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation, bada bing, bada boom, slaves are free. Didn't quite happen like that. And Lincoln called this document a necessary and fit war measure. It was not about the freedom of anybody, any slaves. It was about the maintaining of the Union. That was his sole purpose. As he stated, he would have done it if enslaved Africans would have been free. He would have done it if they couldn't have been free. And the first 13th Amendment, many of us know the 13th Amendment, 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Few of us know the first 13th Amendment. We know the second one. The first 13th Amendment was written and put together by James Buchanan, the 15th President of the United States. Why did he do it? Because when South Carolina seceded from the Union in 1861, he was the president. And his goal, again, was to keep the Union together. So that Article 13 stated this, no amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to Congress the power to establish or interfere with any state, with the domestic institutions thereof, including that a person's held to, slave, to labor or service by the laws of said state. This means if this Article, Article 13 had been ratified in the Constitution, ratified, we would still be enslaved. They were going to make it law that they could not make slavery illegal. That was in 1861 by James Buchanan. It went through the House. It went through the Senate. Unfortunately, it was not ratified, or fortunately for us, for many of us anyway, it wasn't ratified by the president. Because by the time it got through in I think February 28th, 1861, Lincoln's inauguration was the next day and it didn't get ratified. And when it got brought up again, four states opted not to sign off on it. But Lincoln's opinion about this was, as he wrote in his inaugural address, he was very aware of this bill, I understand a proposed amendment to the Constitution has passed Congress to the effect that the federal government shall never interfere with the domestic institutions of the states, including that of persons held to service. I have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable. That's his vantage point about this situation. That it wasn't about freeing the slaves for them. It wasn't about freeing, providing liberty and justice for all. It was about keeping the union together. But here comes the Law League, the Lincoln League. These were a great spy unit, espionage. They utilized their wisdom and wit. It was uncanny. It was so uncanny and so unbelievable that the CIA wrote a document for the Black Dispatches. And they noted the Black Dispatches was a common term used among Union military men for intelligence on the Confederate forces provided by Negroes. This source of information represented the single most prolific and productive category of intelligence obtained and acted on by Union forces throughout the Civil War. We're providing intelligence for our freedom. And many times it worked both ways. Um, I don't know who knows Civil War history like that, but the Civil War was almost over in 1862. General George McCullen was 10 miles outside of Richmond, about to take over Richmond. General George McCullen had the largest army in the Western Hemisphere. Focused, determined, they were winning, they were winning. And they met General Robert E. Lee. They didn't meet General Robert E. Lee. They met a little thing called Quaker Guns. And during this going into Richmond to take over Richmond and end the war, to end the war without having freed the slaves, without having had, had liberty and justice all, but still to bring the Union together, they got some bad intelligence that Robert Lee had these guns and his army was twice the size of what's. And it sent General McCullen back up north, clean. And there's no written proof that the intelligence came from the African Americans. But if you know anything about our people, <laughs> you know they know how to keep a secret, and they know how to do things in their best interest. And they saw that if the, if the war had ended in 1862, guess what? They'd still be enslaved. The wars were not. The Union comes together, we're still enslaved, we're still the losers in this whole thing. So they gave, my belief, they gave some very bad intelligence to the generals, that, Lincoln, that Lee's army was much larger than what it was, and it propelled the Confederacy back up north to fight again. 
and prevented the ending of a war too soon. And this is all part of the Lincoln Law League. Their goal was to make sure that everyone had liberty and justice for all. They didn't care about bringing the, 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 the union together. They cared about making sure that every individual was free. So <clears throat> there was a battle of Antietam. During the, when the Emancipation Proclamation was written, it was also during campaign time. Now also we can remember the 2020 presidential campaign and how pretentious it was. Well, the 1864 or 1862 campaign was about the same level of contention. You're fighting for the freedom of individuals. You're fighting for perceptions. And when they started retreating after uh, the battle with McClellan leaving um, Richmond, there was a need and a push to bring in black troops. However, perception-wise, no one wanted to say, we lo we're losing the war and we need to bring in these African-American troops to help us fight. As William Seward, who was the Secretary of State at the time, said, such a, such a proclamation ought to be a born on the bayonets of an advancing army, not dragged into the dust behind a retreating one. I did this saying that they should be winning and then open up the army to African-Americans instead of retreating and showing that we really need your help. It may be viewed as the last measure of an exhausted government a cry for help, Seward objected. The government stretching forth its hands to Ethiopia, which is what they call African Americans at that time. Instead of Ethiopia stretching forth its hands to the government. This is the Secretary of State, a staunch abolitionist, but also a staunch politician, who understood that for them to win the election, they needed to make sure that it didn't seem like the government was reaching their hands out to the enslaved population to help them, but rather, that we were offering them a, a token for support. This is all part of the Juneteenth story because as we see how Juneteenth was presented to us, we didn't fight for anything. Yet we were the major benefactor, the major force that made the Union successful. And December 31st, 1862 became a very great day, the first watch night service in America. Most of us know, if you go to any Christian church, we know watch night services, correct? Watch night service. And Pastor, can you tell us what the watch night service is? It's New Year's Eve mm -hmm. uh, service that takes place. Uh, usually starts in most churches around 9 o'clock and goes to around 12.30. Mm -hmm. yeah. The first one took place because of the Emancipation Proclamation. Because January 1st, 1863, they wouldn't be free, but they could fight for their freedom. They could now register to be part of the Union Army and now fight for the cause of their own freedom. And we have traditions on January 1st, eating traditions. Anybody recall any of those? I know you. <laughs> Go ahead and share, Robert. <laughs> Black eyed peas, big beef. <laughs> Black eyed peas. And this has a unique cultural tradition as well. And its roots go back to West Africa. The dish on the right looks like what we have in our homes on January 1st, correct? You got to eat your black eyed peas with what? Tomatoes. Stewed tomatoes, correct. Well, this dish is made in West Africa, in Ghana. It's called red red. Red red is made with black eyed peas, some tomatoes, but they call it red red because it's black eyed peas, palm oil, and then ripe plantains, which they call red plantains. So this is a tradition that we had here in West Africa before we came here. And as a part of our remembrance of our African heritage, we opted to do the same thing. But we don't have ripe plantains here in America. We don't have palm oil in America. So what's the red food that we have? Stew tomatoes. <laughs> July 1st. This is our first watch night service and our first tradition of, of eating black eyed peas and tomatoes for good luck. Because they understood they needed luck to have victory in the Civil War. And this is a little something by the numbers. Many of us have never shared these, this information about the amount of soldiers that we had fighting in the war. In the state of Virginia alone, there's approximately 5,723 African American men and women fighting for their freedom, officially. 
within the United States Union Army, there was 185,000 United States Colored Troops. United States Colored Troops in the U.S. Army was more like 209,000, I'm sorry, 209,000 United States Colored Troops. United States Colored Troops made up 10% of the Union Army. They made up 1% of the Northern population and 10% of the Army. They made up 25% of the Navy. Unfortunately, we don't have the exact numbers for the Navy because the Navy was an integrated union unit and did not keep records of differences between a black, white, and others. So, this, but there were 25% of the U.S. Navy was colored was African Americans. And that's approximately 21,000 troops. Probably one of the most famous sailors in the Navy was Harriet Tubman, who was the only female to this day who led a raid for the U.S. military. Led a raid and won it, and she didn't lead it alone. She led it as a general of sorts. Wasn't given that title of general, but she did lead like a general. There were 26 medals of honor given in the United States during the Civil War for the United States Colored Troops. 17 of those came from battles in Virginia, mostly from the Battle of New Market Heights. Five of those were native Virginians. Then many of those were not acknowledged or understood or shared. It was a great military secret, unfortunately, that you know, between 1865 till about 1980 or 1960s, there were no more medals given to black troops. There was an unwritten law that was stated that we were not going to honor these individuals anymore. And up until integration, that, that held true. And most of the individuals who were honored during World War I, during World War II, came posthumously, well after the battle. There were countless heroes who worked as spies, saboteurs, enlisted fighters, enlisted medical support, and information specialists. Roughly about 300,000. And I always want to acknowledge these individuals as well. There's about 180,000 afro Virginians who fought on the Confederate side, or appeared to fight on the Confederate side. And they served as either body servants on the Confederate side, giving up their dignity or their life for logistical support, and many served as counterintelligence officers and deep undercover. And many of those individuals came from right in this area right here. One of the most famous, or most more recognized guy was named, named Charlie, Charlie Wright. Charlie Wright, if that's his real name. And we can't even verify that's his real name or not. But he was from Call Pepper, Virginia. <clears throat> and he gave plenty of information about the Confederacy. Uh, Mr. William, William Jackson served as Jefferson Davis's uh, coachman. And while they were serving, again, they were listening. They were following, <laughs> listening to what they said, and everything was said in there, in their hearing. Everything was said around them. And it was assumed that these individuals were not intelligent. So you would give out your war plans, your battle plans, while somebody was serving you tea. While a man over there in the corner was sitting there waiting for you to ask for some more water. Listening to every word you said. <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> so these individuals gave up the dignity to serve many times at the behest of their family, but ultimately to provide counterintelligence for the Union Army later on. But because they despised, they necessarily could not give up their, their identity. And even after the war, a lot of them kept it a secret because no one wanted to be hunted down. No one wanted to be killed or tagged or labeled a traitor to the Confederate South, especially if you're in Orange County, Virginia, if you're in Louisa, Virginia, if you're in Carolina County, Virginia, if you're in Spotsylvania County. You could not explain or tell anyone what you did in the Civil War because you would be a target. So they kept a lot of those things to themselves and only shared it with family members. But again, the CIA has some documentation of this um, because they end up understanding the brilliance of this strategy amongst these individuals. And there were major battles in which we gave and provided contributions. Uh, the Battle of Fort Wagner, uh, if you ever seen, seen the movie Glory, <clears throat> the 54th Regiment, that's such a unique story because like most things, it doesn't tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the end of Glory, you know, as Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman are charging the, the fort, everything goes black. And then it said at the end in, in the script that these individuals never captured Fort Wagner. Totally false. The Confederates left, fled Fort Wagner, and the Union troops 
United States Black, uh, United States Colored Troops, 45th Regiment, captured that fort and maintained it. But the perception is that we kept losing. We were not good fighters. Nothing about that story says that. I mean, nothing about that movie is really accurate in terms of how the soldiers were. One of the soldiers who fought in that particular regiment was Lewis Douglas, the eldest son of Frederick Douglas. A learned man, a disciplined man. And many of those commanders would often say these men were better soldiers than those that came from um, what's the military uh, West, Point. West Point. Better than any soldiers we got from Yale or Harvard. They were skilled, they were trained. They were training while they were still enslaved. They were still doing regiments. They were still understanding that they were gonna have to one day fight for their freedom. Another misnomer is that individuals, the word came to Texas in 1865 at the end of the war. Reality, United States black troops, United States colored troops, they captured a portion of Southwest Texas, November of 1862. Five regiments under the leadership of General Nathan, Nathaniel Banks captured South Texas, Southwest Texas in 18, November of 1863 and maintained it until 1865, the end of the war. So it's a misnomer that the individuals in, te in Texas didn't know they were free. It just hadn't been, the whole state hadn't been captured yet. But we were there, we understood, we had a presence there. We maintained that presence in Southwest Texas. The Battle of Chafer Farm on New Market Heights was considered to be one of the most glorious battles in the Civil War history. It was so glorious that after the battle and after the war was over, General Benjamin Butler, who was uh, the general during this, this particular battle on New Market Heights, right, right, side of, right outside of Petersburg, he commissioned 200 medals for the survivors of that battle for the United States Colored Troops because they fought so heroically out of his own pocket because they would not be recognized by the U.S. government. He felt they fought so badly he commissioned his own medals for those individuals. The Battle of Richmond, this is the battle right before the fall of, uh, of Appomattox or the fall of the Confederate Army. I'll, I'll go into that in just a second. But we won that one, too. Because from Petersburg, we started to move down. After we won Charleston, uh, the United States Colored Troops were major in the Battle of Charleston, then in the Battle of Richmond, and finally in the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse, in which General Lee surrendered to 13 United States Colored Troops regiments. He surrendered to a whole bunch of black troops. In all, we fought in over 200 battles or skirmishes in the Civil War. And no one seemed to be too small to fight. We had individuals, <clears throat> a gentleman named Elijah Mason, who understood the power of the drum, like most of our sons and daughters. I know when we were in school, we used to beat on the drum, beat on the desk all the time. We had to always make drumming noises. Reverend Sal, you, you, you remember that. <laughs> it was in us, the drum was always in us. The drum was illegal to have in the United States, the African drum. We were not allowed to do it, not allowed to own that during the enslavement period because we knew how to send messages with drums. We knew how to communicate with drums. This was part of our code language. But a gentleman, Elijah Mason, served as a member of the Union Army as a drummer at the ripe old age of eight years old. He served at the age of eight. The average age for a Union drummer was 15. But we understood the value again of our freedom and no one was too small for freedom or to fight for our freedom. This story here is one that everyone should know and nobody knows. This is a gentleman, Major Garland White. Major Garland White was born in Hanover, Virginia, Ashland, Virginia. At the age of 11, he was auctioned off at a slave auction in Richmond and sent down to Georgia. His owner, the gentleman who purchased him, purchased him, got elected to Congress as a senator, and went to D.C. While in D.C., he brought a young man, Garland White, with him. Garland White was not very happy with his position, so he left. He ran away, hit the Underground Railroad, ended up in Ohio, and became a pastor in the AME Church. 
1864, he enlisted in the U.S. color troops. This gentleman, Mr. Garland White, became a chaplain. And as a chaplain in those days, you led the troops. You were leading the troops because you wanted prayer to go before you in battle, in many cases. So he led the troops into battle. Well, April 3rd, 1865, he goes into Richmond, leading the troops into battle. And as he's there, there's a woman who sees him and says, who's that young man leading those guys into battle? That looks like my young Garland. It was his mother. 18 years after he'd been sold away, he returns back to Richmond, Virginia to free his own mother. A story, I mean, a story documented in the Christian Observer in 1865 by his own pen. And now that you can Google it, you can Wikipedia that as well. But it's one of those individuals who should have his own statue, whose story should be told considering he was right in Virginia, considering that he fought in the 25th Army Regiment. 25th Army Regiment became the troop that he was leading that ultimately led to the victory in Richmond. And many times individuals say that they sent in, you know, the Union troops, they sent in their worst troops as cannon fodder. Anybody watch basketball or baseball or football? When you have a starting five out there, you send in your best players or your worst players? Yes. Your best, right? Now, anybody in the military, who goes in first? The best, who? the Marines, the, one, uh, the Airborne, Navy SEAL, they go, you always send in your best. So in the Battle of Richmond, who does, you, who does uh, General Grant send in? His best. United States Colored Troops, 25th Regiment, to lead the way. And in April 9th, uh, 1865, the Colored Troops lead the way again to corner uh, General Lee in Appomattox, and about 3 o'clock in the morning, they go to battle. By 8 o'clock, I believe, it's about done. And Lee waves the white flag and surrenders to 13 United States Colored Troop regiments in Appomattox. And we were so good that the Confederacy decided they were going to have their own Emancipation Proclamation. Another story that's rarely ever shared. Unfortunately, they lost before they could fully enact it. But under the leadership of General Lee and Jefferson Davis, it becomes uh, well known that they're going to start to free the individuals who fight for them, because they see how valuable of a fighting force these individuals are. So they, they start to, you know, as Robert Lee says, the, the government proves that they can fight. And there's, there's a call upon various Louisiana governor at the time says, hey, it's not if they can fight, it's when they can fight. We need them to fight right now for us. Unfortunately, this call came in February of 1865, and by the time it goes out, the war is practically over in, in April. So Virginia's Juneteenth would ideally be April 9th, 1865, when Virginia becomes back part of the Union again. But the real Juneteenth comes December 1865 with the passing of the 30th Amendment. Because prior to this, even in June 19th, 1865, there's still slavery within the Union, within Delaware, within Kentucky, within seven counties in Richmond, 12 parishes in Louisiana. Slavery still exists. Maybe not fully practiced, but it's still on the books. So this is the reality of Juneteenth, that the African-American men and women fought for their freedom. It wasn't someone who came and read a document and they were free. It wasn't the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and they said they were free. We fought for our freedom. We won our freedom. And not just a freedom for ourselves, but for liberty and justice for all of us. And as Lincoln said right before he died, the key to victory and defeat. In 1865, President Lincoln said, about the, without the military help of the black freedmen, the war against the South could not have been won. So in this Juneteenth and every other Juneteenth day after, we need to honor those who made Juneteenth possible. Those United States color troops, those individuals who fought valiantly for their own freedom and the freedom of all those around them. They fought against the odds and against the North. They fought against the odds against the South. But that's how important freedom was to them and to us. And I would be remiss, Juneteenth, if I didn't acknowledge them. 
by the end of James Ellis, James Ellis and his compadres who fought valiantly to make sure that we had a semblance of freedom. Anybody know where this comes from? It says they fought for the right. They died for their country. Cherish their memory. Imitate their example. <laughs> A block up, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is all walk a block up, and you'll see these words inscribed on that stone with the names of individuals who fought against my great grandfather, who fought against your great grandparents to make sure that you would possibly still be enslaved today. We need a new monument up to honor these individuals who fought for the freedom of us all, and not for the freedom of some or the economic gain of some. And as Professor Small says, let history move the mystery. And as Teddy Pendergrass said, teach the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and as I say, to understand the fruit you bear, you have to know the seeds that's been planted. So I want to thank you for your time. And I hope that with this little bit of information I shared with you, that we honor those individuals who made Juneteenth possible. I won't get into the facts and the figures, but I want to make sure that we honor the right ones. That Abraham Lincoln, he did something, but he didn't do the fullness of it. The individuals had to fight valiantly. Individuals lost their lives to ensure that we had this freedom. They need to be honored, respected, and church and remembered. So thank you very much. presentation. I think that uh, I'm not the only one who learned something really interesting, um, and that's why we titled this program today, Untold Stories. So uh, thank you all for um, giving Michael your wonderful attention, and thank you, Michael, for telling us those amazing stories that, honestly, I don't think I've read anywhere else, um, but are all verifiable. <laughs> um, and so coming up next, we have a different take on a similar kind of story. So if you'll bear with us as we transition to Dina Jennings' video, um, we'll be just a moment, and you're, you're in for a treat.
1864, my great-great-great-great-grandfather, Samuel Dry, was on his and we are on the way to fulfilling his dreams. Virginia Ross Williams, my father, Alvin Lee Sims, made sure that I know where I am going. Samuel Dry escaped slavery in the Cumberland Gap of Kentucky. He ran a hundred miles to enlist at Camp Nelson, just south of Lexington. He and 1,400 other Kentucky men found their freedom. Nina, what are we looking for here? There he is, Samuel Dry, without the E. Mm. Uh, Which regiment is this? This is the 123rd Regiment, United States Colored Infantry. There he is. Hey, Grandpappy. Oh. <laughs> Camp Nelson was a massive supply station for the Union Army during the Civil War. I spent two days there and recorded this log. So, I'm Dina Ross Jennings. It's 29 degrees and I am in just south of Lexington, Kentucky at Camp Nelson which is the um, Union camp where my great, 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 great grandfather, Samuel Dry, um, escaped and uh, ran to to get his freedom from slavery. He came with a big wave of black men across Kentucky who were um, allowed to enlist in exchange for their freedom and so I've been wanting to come here um, there's a song that I play called Camp Nelson Blues which was written by two young men by the name of Booker who were actually born here so much history here and it's actually kind of emotional <laughs> for me right now it's very, very cold, it's 29 degrees, and I took a chance on coming here um, because I'm gonna be playing a festival in Lexington, um, which I'm really excited to play. I'm, I'll actually play Camp Nelson at the festival. And um, it's pretty amazing, it's a beautiful place. Um, I hope it was this beautiful when Grandpa Samuel came here because it would have been a relief to just land on this base and um, and be able to be here and have his freedom. So I'm pretty excited about that. I wanna, what I really wanted to do was come here, sit on the porch and play the song, but it's so cold. It's even cold for me and I love snow and I love the cold, um, but it's pretty cold. <laughs> so. Thank you.
for listening thanks for coming with me on this journey because it's pretty pretty cool pretty cool um there's more history and i'll have um because kentucky was not a considered a um a rebel state uh the families of the men who came um the families that came with them they were not considered contraband as part of the war, uh, the Civil War. So since they were not contraband, there were not funds to help the women and children that came with the men, which is really unfortunate because it turned into quite a disaster here. Uh, the women and children had made camps around and um, where they made camps, um, when the U.S. Army finally said, you know, we, we can't do this anymore, they kicked all the women and children out into the woods and burned their little villages, the, the little shanty towns that they had made, and some of them died. Um, then there was a huge outcry from the community, which is why it's important to be an activist. <laughs> if there was a real outcry from the community and said, this isn't right, and so they actually brought the women and children back and built barracks for them to stay in. Kind of rambling because, this, like I said, this is kind of exciting and kind of emotional right now for me to sit here when my great, 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 great grandpappy uh, Samuel came for his freedom. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, dancing, dancing all around. Dancing, dancing all around. Oh, Mo just got here in town. Oh, Mo just got here in town. Hey, Mo, hey, Mo, how was the ride? Hey, Mo, hey, Mo, how was the ride? Mo Sadie's came to ride. Mo Sadie came to ride. I say one, oh, two, three, yeah. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh, dance like me. Dance like me. Dancing all night long.
2018, my husband and I started a music festival on our farm to celebrate my family's commitment to Appalachian music. <music> So now we're all in the same place, having watched Dina's lovely video. I just want to take another moment to say thank you to the African American Historical Society here in Orange County, Michael, Dina, our board, Ed, who helped me here on the sound. <laughs> and all of you who were able to join us either online or in person. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm so glad that things have progressed to a point where we can have you here. So thank you for being part of the Art Center in Orange and our community.